Hello, I'm Justine Brown. Welcome back to my bookshelf. Please do subscribe if you haven't had the chance. Um, this is the third in a series explaining Jacobitism. Every January 30th, a somber event in the annals of English history, the execution of King Charles I, is commemorated in London and at Windsor Castle, where the Stuart King lies buried. This year, for the first time, I attended the ceremony just outside the banqueting house in Whitehall, where Charles met the executioner on that cold winter's morning in 1649. The chill brought back a salient detail. Charles had called for an extra shirt that day, so that he would not appear to onlookers to be shaking with fear. A large group of us observed the wreath laying, then processed inside for an Anglo-Catholic service. Anglo-Catholics, not to be confused with Roman Catholics, are the highest of high Anglicans. They revere Charles as a martyr to Puritan excesses. Sitting beneath the banqueting house's fervently Baroque ceiling, created by Charles's favorite court painter, Peter Paul Rubens, our eyes are constantly drawn up to ethereal and yet vividly fleshy crowds of figures drawn heavenwards. The effect is one of assumption on a grand scale. Charles commissioned Rubens, his favorite court painter, to create the ceiling. It celebrates the reign of his father, James I and VI of Scotland. Charles was the English monarchy's most ardent patron of the arts. His um, extraordinary collection was reassembled for the first time last year in 2018 for an exhibition at the Royal Academy. In his homily, the priest reminded us that the prisoner king was led through the banqueting house on his way to face the executioner. Charles's much beloved Rubens decor was one of the last things he saw on his last day on earth. This may have been engineered in order to mock him, to underline the contrast between James's accomplished reign and his own so very turbulent one, or to taunt him with memories of better days. In the event, the sight of the celestial skyscape seems to have strengthened his resolve. For even his enemies admitted that Charles I conducted himself with great dignity on the scaffold that day, calmly addressing the huge and silent crowd, exhausted by seven years of civil war. He even managed a subtle jest about preserving the sharpness of the axe. Hurt not the axe, he said, that it may hurt me. "'Tis the ultimate in cavalier nonchalance from, to quote the poet Robert Herrick, the brave prince of cavaliers. Consider these lines from Andrew Marvel's An Horatian Ode. Marvel was firmly in the roundhead camp, yet his depiction of Charles is respectful, even tender. That thence the royal actor born, the tragic scaffold might adorn, while round the armed bands did clap their bloody hands. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but with his keener eye the axe's edge did try, nor called the gods with vulgar spite to vindicate his helpless right, but bowed his comely head down as upon a bed. Marvel represents Charles's death as a tragedy in multiple senses, making the most of clear parallels between public execution and the theater, and hinting at catharsis. The scaffold is a stage, the onlooker is an audience, the prisoner an actor. The king plays his role with restraint, but the bloody hands remind us that this is no fiction. Tried and convicted by the rump parliament of having made war against that institution, which, they claimed, amounted to a war on the people, Charles was an early casualty of the nascent modern structure, as Mencius Moldbug terms it. Unlike the later kings of England, Charles Stuart was unwilling to accept the successive transfers of power that Whig history decrees. It is difficult to overstate the shock that the execution of Charles I produced in England and in the rest of Europe. To grasp the violence of this rupture, we must, whatever our political attitudes, make an effort of imagination and try to transcend the biases of our age. 
the modern structure in which we are embedded has trained us to work, wink at words like rebellion and to affirm revolution and indeed to prize political turbulence and infighting as evidence of a healthy democracy. This is due to the fact that our political structures are founded upon such things. Even with constitutional monarchies like the United Kingdoms and its former colonies, we pay respect to events like the Glorious Revolution. The effect, events rather of the English Civil War sowed the seeds of the American War of Independence and prefigured the much more virulent French Revolution. But what progressive historians see as the inevitable result of irresistible forces, even natural, would have seemed anything but natural to the vast majority of 17th century English subjects. Regicide was the inversion of the natural. For many centuries, since the retreat of the Romans, kings had ruled in Britain. There had been dynastic conflict, of course, and frequent debate, chiefly among the nobility, over who should be king, as, for example, during the Wars of the Roses, when cousins struggled over the crown. Almost no one questioned whether there should be a king at all. Democracy, a word so reverenced in our time, denoted mob rule to our forefathers, a case of the tail wagging the dog. To get a sense of it, think of a lawless mob, irrational, possessed. Picture vigilante actions such as a lynching, and then magnify its effects endlessly. That feeling of horror hints at our ancestors' response to the word democracy. As Robert Herrick wrote, quote, Preposterous is that government and rude when kings obey the wilder multitude. Unquote. Kingship was rep replicated throughout the great chain of being. Nature was composed of divinely ordained kingdoms, animal, vegetable, and mineral. Royalty was emblematized in such things as lions, roses, and gold. Nature attested to the rightness of monarchy. In short, mon monarchic hierarchy underpinned reality. When Macbeth murders Duncan, he violates the great chain of being and chaos ensues. Imagine the horror then, when the executioner brandished the head of Charles I. Such a thing violated nature. The world lurched, and indeed contemporary witnesses record the sudden moan of the crowd at that moment. It was as though they never believed the execution would actually happen, and when it did, they reeled. The king was dead, but there were no reassuring cries of long live the king to usher in the next. The rump parliament was installing a republic. It was a wholly novel situation in an age that lacked our cult of newness. The leader of today can be said to personify the nation, but the monarch truly embodied it. The English, like most European peoples, had long conceived of themselves in terms of a body. Scholars commonly referred to the body politic. The head of this body was, of course, the king. He was the seat of reason. He governed the members, organs, and so on that made up the whole. Each subject had his part to play in creating a harmonious being, but the head conferred purpose, meaning, and coherence. This concept of the body politic is closely paralleled in that of Christ and the Church. Christ is the head of the Church, which is also seen as a body. So the position of the King echoed the position of Christ. Both were seen as having two bodies, one literal, one spiritual. And this close association between the King's role and that of the King of Kings further imbued the institution of the monarchy with the sense of rightness and naturalness. It also meant that the royal body was treated with the utmost reverence and care. The monarch was popularly believed to possess the power of healing touch. One thing, the closer one was to the bo royal body, the more of an honor it was. The most intimate with the royal incarnation had incredible prestige, 
it was anything but low status to wash the king's person. These intimate roles were filled by some of the highest ranking people in the realm. To wait on the king or queen was the most exalted servitude imaginable. Given these deeply imbued ideas about the royal body and kingship generally, we may wonder what on earth had changed to permit this faction of officials to lay hands on King Charles, to prison, try, and ultimately execute him, despite the lack of widespread support for these actions. In many respects, Charles had the preceding dynasty, the Tudors, to thank for his misfortune. In the first place, Henry VIII had, through the dissolution of the monasteries and reassignment of the properties, created a new class of political players. This new class were profoundly incentivized to support the Reformation and to resist any hint of a reversal. It was one reason that they supported the intensifying effort to purify the Anglican Church, of any residual Roman Catholicism, hence Puritans. Henry VIII had traded land for loyalty to his radical new policy. In this way, he seeded England with Protestantism. Only landowners could become MPs, so providing them with land, Henry made it possible for them to wield political power. Over a century following Henry's reign, Parliament had become a much more powerful institution. Religious policy continued to have practical political consequences. One of the sources of the royalist parliamentarian conflict stemmed from the fact that Charles's Archbishop, William Laud, had expressed an interest in recovering monastic lands, this time in the name of the Anglican Church. This prospect, of course, threatened those whose families had benefited from the dissolution. Acquiring land had given them the motivation and the means to resist any threat to their status. And of course, each of these individuals existed within a complex web of obligation and loyalty involving family members, tenants, their dependents, and so on. And now we begin to grasp how entrenched the division had become. The most charitable interpretation of Henry VIII's break with Rome is that he forced his remarriage to Anne Boleyn through in order to beget a legitimate male heir and so prevent another Wars of the Roses. Henry was trying to make them loyal to his project and to him personally. Ironically, the descendants of these men rose up against the monarchy. The policy was instrumental in eventually creating the conditions for the English Civil War, First came the state-engineered Protestant-Catholic split. The old religion, which had been practiced in the British Isles for a millennium, was cleverly rebranded as foreign. Then Protestantism came apart. The Anglican Church splintered dramatically as a host of tiny Puritan sects emerged. Baptists, ranters, Quakers, diggers, Grindletonians, Muggletonians, Fifth Monarchists, etc., and not only was there a disastrous civil war, but the crown itself was abolished for 11 years and never fully recovered from this blow. Charles's execution was Puritan iconoclasm taken to the next stage. Another Tudor policy which made Charles's execution thinkable was the example Elizabeth had set in putting his grandmother Mary Queen of Scots, to death in 1567. As I discussed in previous video, Elizabeth I signed her cousin's death warrant because she could no longer afford the presence in England of a rival queen with an arguably better claim to the throne, someone around whom Catholics could continue to rally. Mary had been the focus of more than one plot to replace Elizabeth, this time it appeared that the Queen of Scots herself had been directly involved. The danger was palpable. However, Elizabeth hesitated to go through with the execution despite the prodding of her advisors. Either she kept Mary alive and risked being assassinated, or she executed a fellow queen and thereby made it easier to conceive of regicide. And this is precisely what happened when 
She eventually followed through with Mary's sentence. The execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, contributed to the desacralization of the royal body. Elizabeth made monarchs everywhere more vulnerable. She had cheapened their lives, her own as well, and she knew it. Even so, the parliamentary government were well aware that they were taking an enormous step in executing King Charles and installing Republic. They had, to put it mildly, a serious public relations problem. How did the regicides hope to present themselves as anything but grossly unnatural? Their solution was to try to frame their rebellion using ancient precedents. Classical Greece and Rome could confer prestige upon their project. The parliamentary government, known as the Protectorate when Oliver Cromwell became leader, made frequent appeals to Greek and Roman political history. They referenced the overthrow of Rome's seventh king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, in 509 BC, and the establishment of the Roman Republic, which lasted until the empire was founded in 27 BC. According to tradition, the six preceding kings had been just, but Lucius had been a tyrant. Tyranny, the Republicans argued, justified popular uprising, and this is how they wished to present their coup d'etat, as a popular uprising against tyranny. They redefined regicide as tyrannicide. The object was to cast a small minority which had seized power, the rump, as the people. Rhetorical support poured forth from the poet John Milton, one of the Republic's most dedicated defenders. When the noted humanist Claude Salmasius published a powerful denunciation of the king killers, Milton fought back with the tract, Defense of the English People. Even with the title, Milton is begging the question. He identifies the rump parliament with the English people, despite the fact that they had purged not only the royalists, but anyone who had misgivings about executing the king to whom they had all pledged loyalty. Mencius Moldbug draws our attention to these lines from Charles's final speech. And I quote, For the people, and I truly desire their liberty and their freedom as much as anybody whomsoever. But I must tell you that their liberty and their freedom consists in having of government those laws by which their life and their goods may most be their own." So this then was Charles's conviction that monarchy had to secure order, life and property, before the people could thrive. Security preceded liberty. Charles prized harmony above all else. Tragically, his reign was discordant in the extreme. Charles was dead and buried in St. George's Chapel. The idea of watering the seedling republic with Charles's blood was not a success. The sheer weirdness of the Republican period deserves a video of its own. In any case, it couldn't survive the death of Oliver Cromwell in 1658, and in 1660, the monarchy had been restored under Charles II. Although the reunion of the English people with their king was joyous, it was clear that kingship had been renegotiated for the modern structure. Charles II could scarcely forget what had happened to his father. No ruler could. The frivolity that characterized his reign was calculated to outrage the Puritans who had supported the regicides, that is, those who survived. As a boy, Charles II had fought by his father's side in the wars. As a young man, he had escaped to the continent, where his younger brother, James, was living in safety with his mother and sisters, only to hear the bitter news of their father's death. I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, Charles had said in his final speech. The story of the star-crossed Stuart dynasty had only just begun. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like uh, if you did, and um, I look forward to hearing your comments below.